down and worship kneel to the Lord our maker this is our God our shepherd we are the flock led with care and as we gather together we know that our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth and now grace to you and peace from God Almighty and Jesus Christ our Lord through the powerful work of God's Holy Spirit. Amen.
In spite of God's gift of love to us, we often act in destructive and hateful ways. We close our hearts to God and we disobey God's law. Together, let us confess our sin. Have mercy on me, O God, in your faithful love. In your great tenderness, wipe away my offenses. Wash me thoroughly from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I am well aware of my offenses. My sin is constantly in mind. Against you, you alone, I have sinned. I have done what you see to be wrong, that you may show your saving justice when you pass sentence, and in your victory may appear when you give judgment. Remember, I was born guilty, a sinner from the moment of conception. But you delight in sincerity of heart, and in secret you teach me wisdom. God, grant in me a clean heart, Renew within me a resolute spirit. Do not thrust me away from your presence. Do not take away from me your spirit of holiness. Give me back the joy of your salvation. Sustain in me a generous spirit. Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will speak out your praise. Sacrifice gives you no pleasure. Burnt offerings you do not desire. Sacrifice to God is a broken spirit, a broken, contrite heart you never scorn. People of God, here are words you may trust, words that merit full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, to all who confess their sins and resolve to lead a new life. He says, your sins are forgiven. He also says, follow me. Now to the one who rules over all worlds, immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory forever and ever. And then the question is, how do we respond? How do we show our gratitude for God's love, mercy, and forgiveness? These words from Philippians chapter 2 give us good guidance on how we ought to live. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Our Psalter reading is from Psalm 18. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so I shall be saved from my enemies. The courts of death encompassed me, the torrents of perdition assailed me, and the courts of Sheol entangled me. 
The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. for the children. This afternoon, I will be baking, and I brought some ingredients with me that I will need to make my cake. Most of us like cake, but I wonder, would you ever eat the ingredients separately? How about, how about a spoon of flour? Maybe a raw egg. This vanilla extract smells really good. What do you think? How would each of these ingredients taste? Yuck. But there's also some sugar. Yum. On their own, these ingredients may not taste very good. But once we put them together, it will be a delicious cake. Like a baker, God is able to blend the good and bad experiences of our life together for our good. The Bible is full of some great examples. Today's story is about the 12 brothers who were the sons of Jacob. One of these brothers was named Joseph, and the other brothers didn't like him very much because their father favored Joseph. The brothers were jealous, and they did a very bad thing. They sold Joseph to a traveling man who was on his way to Egypt. In Egypt, Joseph became a slave. Then he was wrongly accused and ended up in jail. Joseph went through some hard times and some scary, sad experiences, but he also met Pharaoh, the most important man in the country. If we look at all the individual pieces of Joseph's life, some were good and some were pretty bad. But we must look at the result after all the pieces are blended together. If Joseph had not been sold into slavery, he would not have been in a position to save his family from a famine. Many years later, Joseph's brothers came to Egypt. Joseph forgave his brothers and explained to them that God sent him to Egypt so God could use him to preserve a remnant of God's chosen people. What is a remnant? What does it mean to preserve a remnant? A remnant is something that is left over. God sent Joseph ahead to make sure that his family did not die. The remnant survives. And Joseph's family would become the Israelites, the ancestors of Jesus. Joseph's story reminds us that our lives can be compared to a cake. Separately, there are some bitter times. There are some raw, hurtful times. There are dry, bland times. But there are good times too. God knows from the beginning that our lives will come together. And just like the cake, it will be good. 
Romans chapter 8, verse 28, gives us a beautiful promise. We know that God makes all things work together for the good of those who love him and are chosen to be a part of his plan. Let us pray. Dear God, not all parts of life are good. But let us remember that in God's hands, all our days can be mixed and blended into a beautiful creation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Dear children, let us love, not in word or speech, but also in truth and action. Let us pray. Ever-present God, with this offering we present also ourselves, all that we have been, all that we are, all that we shall become, and our resolve to walk in your way. Accept us and our offerings, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now hear the word of God. Our first reading is from the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, chapter 45, verses 1 through 8. Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors." So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. And then a reading from the epistles, Romans chapter 8, verses 29 through 30, 28 through 39. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? 
He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. It is Jesus Christ who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. <clears throat> And then a reading from the gospel according to Mark, chapter 8, verses 22 through 26. Jesus cures a blind man. They came to Bethsaida. Some people brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had put saliva on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Can you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he looked intently, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Then he sent him away to his home, saying, Do not even go into the village. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of the most difficult theological questions over the centuries is, why do people suffer? If this question is not hard enough, let's add to the complexity. Why do good people suffer? One could argue, wrongly, that wicked people deserve their suffering, but good people do not. And let's up the ante one more time. Why does a good and powerful God allow the existence of evil and suffering? This is what is called the theodicy question. And there are various ways to ask the same question. If God is powerful and good, why does God tolerate evil? If God is omnipotent and almighty, how is it possible that evil can exist outside of God's power? And perhaps the most sensitive and confusing question is, do evil and suffering fall within the realm of God's will? In other words, is it, God, is it God's will that bad things happen to good people? Many good-meaning people have tried to console suffering people by saying something like, it is God's will that this or that terrible thing happened to you. Now, these words, of course, do not really comfort grieving people for what normal person wants to worship a God who wills terrible suffering of innocent people. The word theodicy is relatively new, used for the first time in the 18th century. However, humankind has wrestled with the concept of evil and suffering from the very beginning. For example, the disciples of Jesus in John chapter 9, verse 2, are looking for a reason why a man was blind. 
Rabbi, they asked Jesus, who sent this man or his parents that he was born blind? For them, there had to be a reason for his blindness. Someone must have sinned. And Jesus replied, neither this man nor his parents sinned. Now, many have tried to explain the reality of suffering and why a loving God would tolerate bad things to happen. Most of you are familiar with what is called a dualistic solution. It goes something like this. There are two opposite forces, God and the devil, good and evil, light and darkness. And evil is constantly attacking God's good creation. Evil or the devil is responsible for suffering, not God. Another solution to justify evil as part of the good creation is called the harmonious solution. And this solution suggests that good is appreciated only when it is seen as the opposite of evil. You cannot really appreciate light if there is no darkness. Without the existence of evil, everything would be good. Goodness would simply be normal and expected. The pluralistic solution suggests that good and evil are both part of God's essence, and God's creation reflects the complexity and mystery of God. Now, all of these possible solutions have some shortages. They have some insufficiencies. The Judeo-Christian tradition does not directly answer the theodicy question. The Bible, however, reveals that God is the source of all good, completely wise and just. God is not the author of evil. And the Bible is clear that God's creation was very good at the beginning. But as you know, shortly after God created everything good and saw that it was very good, something went wrong. And evil and sin entered God's good creation, and then things spun out of control. Mundane things like work and giving birth became a burden. Relationships between brothers deteriorate, and family became mortal enemies. And with the mystery of sin and evil, suffering and death became part of this world. Now, most of us perhaps don't spend much time thinking about the theodicy question or contemplating about the origins of evil or the impact of sin on this beautiful creation. But all of us know from experience that our world our relationships, our lives are a constant struggle filled with suffering. We are all aware of how random, dangerous, broken, evil, wretched, and painful life can be. We are aware of how selfish, unkind, immoral, greedy, wicked, and vulnerable our human race can be. Our generation is living through a pandemic that is causing more suffering, death, and trauma than this country has experienced in more than a century. One of the world's most cited and comprehensive multidisciplinary scientific journals published a scientific study about bereavement multipliers. And their analysis shows that for every COVID-19 death, Approximately nine surviving Americans will lose a grandparent, a parent, a sibling, a spouse, or a child. And this is a staggering number. Consider that we are approaching 500,000 deaths in the USA. This means that about 4.5 million people have lost a close family member in the last year. The suffering is immense. Where is God in all of this? Why does God allow this kind of suffering? 
And what does the Bible say to us today? Is God perhaps absent? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, who is our God too, does not promise that suffering will never happen to people. Believing in God does not mean that everything will be smooth sailing. People of faith is not excluded from suffering. They too will experience pain and loss, and ultimately, we will all die. This is certain, and the Bible does not present us with any false hope. But the Bible is very honest about life. You see, we see in Genesis, in our reading today, that an ancient family lived in a real world similar and worse than ours. Let me give you a brief background of Joseph's story. Joseph was the, was the son of Jacob and Rachel. He had one brother, Benjamin, and ten half-brothers. Joseph was Jacob's favorite son, a dreamer, maybe a bit arrogant. His half-brothers did not like him. Actually, they hated him. They wanted to get rid of him. They wanted to kill him. Reuben, one of his half-brothers, suggested that instead of spilling blood, they threw him in a pit, and they did that. But then Judah, another half-brother, suggested they sell him. And then Joseph got sold for 20 pieces of silver. The Ishmaelites who bought Joseph took him to Egypt. And there Joseph rose to power when famine came over the Near East. And during the famine, Joseph's brothers went to Egypt to buy food. And after the powerful Joseph detained his brother Benjamin... Judah makes an impassioned, impassioned speech that their father would die if Benjamin is not released. And his words show that they had learned from their mistakes. And then Joseph revealed himself to his brothers. And this story reveals real emotional agitation. There is something real about their experience that we can all relate to. Jealousy, evil scheming, ruthless actions, sorrow, regret, pain, and loss. And this narrative reveals how complex human life is. A father's preference for one child leads to envy. Envy leads to a bad decision, and a bad decision leads to pain, loss, and suffering. A combination of an external catastrophe, famine, and people's existential concerns turn this situation into a perfect tragic storm. We see how evil flourishes and gets the upper hand and ultimately ends in human heartbreak. But as the narrative unfolds, we see what is of paramount importance in the entire Joseph story. God's hand directs all the confusion of human guilt ultimately toward a gracious goal. A close reading shows that God is, in fact, the acting agent. It was not you who sent me here, but God. God has made me a father to the Pharaoh. It was not the brother's hate, but God who brought Joseph to Egypt to preserve life. The great theological point is that God saw to it that a remnant remains and that there will be survivors. The narrative thus shines light on the saving activity of God. The saving activity of God. Old Testament scholar Gerhard von Rath says it best, and I quote, Joseph interprets the confused event in this comprehensive sense as the mysterious realization of a divine act of rescue. For as often in the Old Testament remnant, is a word of hope. In the remnant, 
the whole group survives to new life. By God's guidance, everything, including suffering, pain, loss, and regret, appears in a completely new light and is turned into a divine act of rescue. This is what a faith perspective does to anything and everything that come our way, whether good or bad. God is able to take the worst that life and evil can throw at us and uses it, bends it, and shapes it so that God's purpose for our lives is accomplished. God's mysterious work sees to it that there is always a remnant, always hope. So whenever we feel abandoned, disappointed, despair, and regret, the story of Joseph reminds us that God is at work in a divine act of rescue, bringing divine hope for all. Nostalgia means a sentimental longing or wistful affection of the past, for the past. A New Testament professor of mine once said that people of faith should not have a longing for the past, but a longing for, a, for the future. And he based it on the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8. You see, the Apostle considers the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with glory about to be revealed to us. And after referring to the work of God's Spirit, he too refers to hope. For in hope we are saved. And as he continues, he says that the Spirit of God helps us in our weakness, for the Spirit intercedes for us. And then the next few verses give us a deep theological insight into the apostles' view of God's work in the midst of a real world of random suffering, pain, regret, lies, loss, and guilt. And this is what he says. We know that all things work together for the good for those who love God. One could say that people of faith take the long view of life. They may know there will be distractions of suffering, pain, and real work of evil forces, but for people of faith, the outcome is certain. God will see to it that all things work together for good. In other words, people of faith have seen the conclusion of our life story, and the ending is a good one. And then he goes on to say this, God foreknew, predestined, called, justified, and glorified. Now I know that one word here has captured your attention, predestined. Unfortunately, over the years, this word has led to many and serious misconceptions. Some believe that God has predetermined your faith so that you have no say in it. And this is, of course, not the purpose of the text. We need to look at the whole context. And all of these five words are in the past tense. The apostle is so convinced of God's love for humankind, of the redemption in Christ, of the fact that our story with God will end well, that he explains the ground for our well-being in the past tense. It is a done deal. In essence, this is what the Apostle Paul is saying. Yes, bad things can and most likely will happen. You will suffer and I will suffer and we won't live on this earth forever. People will say bad things about you. Friends and family will disappoint you and you will disappoint others. Life is about loss and loss is always painful. Life is hard and people can be cruel, but when everything is said and done, you can be 100% sure that God will still love you. God will be with you. And God will see to it that you are welcomed in 
into God's presence. In verse 38, he says, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Once again, let me remind you that the apostle is so convinced of this that he is already saying it's a done deal. He uses the past tense. The early church understood and embraced this message as well. They accepted that everything will end well for them, even as they were ridiculed, persecuted, and executed because of their faith. They held on to this hope, and somehow God enabled them to find joy in spite of their suffering. For them, the goodness and love of God outweighed everything else. And the authors of our standard, one of our standards, the Heidelberg Catechism, agreed with them when they asked this question, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And here is the answer. That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation because I belong to him. Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholehearted, willing, and ready from now on to live for him. They too knew that the stories of their life will end well. And we know that the stories of our lives will end well too. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, for it is holy and right to do so. Almighty and everlasting God, we give you thanks for your love, your grace, mercy, and patience with us. You have revealed yourself to us as a forgiving God who is ever willing to start new with us. You are the comfort of the sad and the suffering. You strengthen us and lift us up when we fall. We especially feel vulnerable as we feel that powers are at work that are much stronger than us. Remind us that you are with us and that nothing will separate us from your love. 
We thank you for the assurance that you are able to bend and change adversity into something good. To everyone in distress today, grant mercy, grant relief, grant refreshment, and grant newness. We pray for your world caught up in a devastating pandemic. Deliver us, we pray. Help us to hold on to our hope in you that you will never forsake us. We pray that your spirit move us to respond to evil, fear, vulnerability, and uncertainty with love. We pray that when the roads of our lives seem, seem dreary and endless, the skies gray and threatening, when our lives have no music in them and our hearts are lonely and our soul, souls lost their courage, flood our paths with your light. Turn our eyes to where the skies are full of promise. Turn our hearts to brave music. Give us a sense of belonging and fill our beings with your love and hope. We pray for our country and all of our elected leaders. Unite us and help us to see the good in each other. Be with those who are sick and who are suffering. We pray for Carolyn Cromer, Craig DeRusso. We pray for Bob Frank, who had surgery and is recovering from surgery, but we know that it will be a long recovery. We pray for Wayne and Sandy Morris, friends of the Alheims. We pray for Wayne, who is very sick with COVID-19. We continue to pray for our homebound members and everyone who is struggling during the pandemic, young and old. We pray for all refugees, victims of natural disasters, war, and violence. Hear us, O oh God, as we pray, for we pray it in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying in one voice, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
people of God know that God is in control of our lives and with it we know in Christ our futures are safe in God's hand. Go into this world, live with that assurance, and as you do so, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God Almighty, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.